This is a Profunda TV special, an interview with the Reverend Jonathan D. Mall, author of The Abortion Dilemma. So an important issue to address is that the people who are against a woman's right to choose are not wrong with what they say. They're just not right in a wider, more zoomed out view. Their desire to protect, to protect life is not wrong. How they are classifying and qualifying life is being done in a way that the opposite effect is being achieved. So it's not that I disagree with those who call themselves pro-life. I don't agree with their use of the phrase. And I think it hides uh, in a more important intent, which is to protect the quality of life. When I hang out in the rather hostile pro-life Reddit waters and have these conversations, I still come out rather unscathed. But there is this belief that among them that life is suffering. Therefore, the fact that children are born into suffering doesn't mean they can't have great lives, can't triumph and prevail. But to codify in law that suffering is your path is weird to me. And I don't think they see that that's what they're doing while trying to defend the word prison, which is that life equals fertilized egg. And when you really think about what is life and what is the gift of life that we give, uh, when a couple wants to express their love for themselves, for their family, for the, all that the creator gave, and they want to create life, that's a beautiful thing. They're not thinking in their head, uh, we want to create suffering and poverty and hunger and cognitive development problems. And there's so much data on what goes wrong when you don't allow people the luxury of planning for life. And that is an important thing that is being lost on that side of the argument, is should we protect life from the conceptual level? If a young couple want to get their schooling, their careers, do everything they can so that they can be good parents, should they be told that the life you planned for five years, 10 years in the future, right? You're only gonna have one kid, maybe biologically you can't have more. You only wanna have two kids. Should families be 27 kids? No, we know that there's gonna be limits to the number of children in any family, we know that. So why are we saying that you can't have the children you plan for, you can only have the children that are caused by accident? That's not being pro-life. That's just being pro-birth and pro-existence from a cellular point of view. I'm talking with Reverend Jonathan D. Mall, author of The Abortion Dilemma. He has a unique set of views and it's worth listening to. Why did you write The Abortion Dilemma? This is an important book, but why did you write it? I appreciate that you think it is. I and the simple answer is to reduce suffering. Uh, when I look at what's happening in this challenging issue, uh, at the end of the day, we're forgetting that women are suffering. And it's the 70% of the women who are receiving abortions uh, identify as women of faith. That's hundreds of thousands of women who are living in conflict and torment because they are being told that what they're doing is against God, against the Bible, against their communities. And it's simply not true. 
Well, why do you say so emphatically it's not true? Well, both from a standpoint of the Bible itself and the words that are in there, and from an understanding of what would be a divine intent. Uh, the, I came across uh, the passage of the Old Testament, Numbers 5, which is a biblical adultery test. It is for a man who thinks his wife has been unfaithful and doesn't know what to do about it. So he brings it to the priest who gathers up the dust from the tabernacle floor and mixes a bitter water to make a potion that he utters a curse from the Lord over. And if she's been unfaithful, well, now we get to a thing. If uh, you read the King James Version, that Elizabethan language is that her belly will swell and her thigh will rot and she will become a curse and say, amen, amen. But what does it mean if her thigh rots? No one can quite say that except people have said that. Modern translations have looked at this very carefully. Scholars have looked at this very carefully because language is subject to change. And if you read the NIV, which is the Bible favored by evangelicals, it very clearly states that she will miscarry. So the priest administers an abortifacient and the jealous husband doesn't have to worry anymore about the paternity. Uh, if that is the case, then God is sanctifying abortion. Now, if you look deeper, there is nothing in the Bible that says when life begins. There is nothing in the Bible that says thou shalt not commit abortion. And there are commandments. And it seems a very peculiar thing to have left to have you know, been left out of the Bible if it was important to the creator, as opposed to the people who were interpreting the word of the creator. Abortion has existed forever. Uh, you can read ancient manuscripts going back to the 16th century uh, before the common era that uh, give formulas for abortifacients. This is the I believe that nature is a gift from the creator and in nature are all the tools necessary for a woman to control her own destiny relative to having children. Now, the fact that for the longest time, abortion was common practice, it's only in the modern era of the moral majority creating a political ideology that said abortion was bad, that we're in this true fight. Because prior to that, it didn't really hit the radar of religious people. It was considered a personal decision, a decision between the woman and her husband and her uh, minister or you know, pastor, whoever is leading her in, in religious faith. It was considered personal. But that changed in the 70s when it became a political wedge. There are issues, people who will claim it has to do with uh, issues of racism with uh, lots of things that I don't want to touch upon. What I'm interested in is what would the creator want? And are we living to honor the creation and honor the creator? Well, that's an even more difficult topic that I can't touch. I mean, how can we even say what the creator would want? How would we even know? Well, it's a wonderful question. We can know by looking at the creation things are as they must be. So when we consider the question of, does the creator believe that life begins at the moment of conception? Well, we'd have to say no, because the creator built into women the biological mechanism of miscarriage. And biology has allowed us to, has allowed us to understand the incredibly complicated process of going from one fertilized egg to 40 trillion cells in a human body. And easily 50% of, of them end through miscarriage. If a, a woman miscarries within the first month or has an irregular period, you never know. So the numbers could be higher, but we know it's at least 30 to 50%. There is this period of latency where biologically speaking, the body looks at things and says, okay, this is working out okay, or it's not. And if that mechanism is built into us as a gift from the creator, then clearly we aren't trying to say that the creator is a mass murderer when 50% of fertilizations end. Ah, I see where you're going with this. So um, let's, let's just go simpler right now. So let's say, so who's the classic kind of person you want to have read your book? Your book is available. Um, it's an easy to read book. Um, so who's your, who's your audience for your book? 
The audience for my book is anyone who is conflicted in this issue, but particularly it is written for women of faith because they represent 70% of the procedures, then they are the ones who are living in conflict. There are hundreds of thousands of women a year who are hiding from their families, who are hiding from their communities, focus on the family, looked at this and said that they're going silently from the church pews to the abortion clinics. They do not have the support of their community. They live in the shadows. They live in, in pain because they are being told that they are bad, immoral, murderers. It's the, they mm -hmm. won't admit it. They won't go to their community for support, for knowledge, for aid in what is a very difficult and personal decision. And so it is for them. I want them to realize that God doesn't disagree with them. They are not to be treated as pariahs. They are doing nothing against scripture, against nature, against the divine. They are doing what is right for their families and for themselves and for the creation of new life so that that new life can have the advantages and not the disadvantages. Since most unwanted pregnancies are just because of, first of all, 75% of these women are, are in poverty. Uh, so the people who are being forced into greater hardship should not be made to endure that because we're claiming that's what God wants. No one, I don't believe in a creator who builds suffering as the basis for life. That's a, that's an extraordinary uh, thought and observation. What this is a, a very complex issue. It is, it requires great nuance and we're not using great nuance. That's the challenge. So the intellect has to serve the emotional needs of a very difficult situation. So let's just say the doctor walks into the uh, hospital room and there's a choice that has to be made. Let's talk about what that choice might be and how that decision would be made. Let's just say it's a case of rape or a case of either there's something wrong with the baby, either way, or the, I shouldn't even use that word baby because that would be counter to what you're saying. Something's wrong with the uh, embryo. Yeah, so it's a very complicated interwoven challenge. Using the word baby is both right and wrong depending on how we want to apply the term. Colloquially, there's a baby growing. The people who call themselves pro-life are using that as if there is this fully developed being that's just waiting to come out. So in the early part of pregnancy, and in Jewish law, a developing child is just water for the first 41 days, which is why in Jewish law, they don't have a problem with a woman having this procedure because there is no human in their understanding. Obviously, genetically, it is always a human, but the word nefesh that they use for human it has baked into it the notion that it is one that, that has breathed the air of the world. So until you have uh, taken a breath, you are not considered truly a human being in Jewish law. They consider the developing child part of the mother's body. Uh, so if something goes horribly wrong and the doctor comes to you and says, we don't know how to tell you this, but something's gone horribly wrong. Either your wife is gonna live or your child is gonna live. Which one would you like? Now, how do you make a decision in that moment? It's not a rational decision, an intellectual decision. You can't chart it on a graph. You can only ask your heart, what is the right thing to do? And if your partner is the center of your world and that's the most important thing, then the baby doesn't matter. You can make another one. If you have had nothing but the desire to create new life, tried many times, this is the absolute last chance. And the, you know that your wife couldn't live with the choice to save her over the baby, then, then that's the choice you make. But no one can tell you what's right in that moment. You know, only your heart can do that. And in many circumstances, you're saying this is also a matter of the heart. In the case of a young woman being raped, also 
um, there are many other emotional issues involved in this decision. Yes. So, so this explains why, as I see it, that you are dealing with this not only on an intellectual basis, but also, and from your research, you're dealing with it from a religious perspective and giving advice so that people do not suffer or at least have some support with their decision. Am I reading that correctly? Yes, and, and more so, I am a reverend writing about a religious issue because a lot of people who are against a woman's right to choose are using or trying to use scripture or trying to speak for God or trying to say they know better. And that is one of the key reasons why I had to write this book because scripture does not say that abortion is bad, wrong, and shouldn't be done. There's nowhere in the Bible that forbids abortion. There is a very clear passage where a priest administers an abortifacient, and there are arguments about, is that correct? That's not what God meant, and I know this because we translated it. Well, no. There are many modern translations that use the word miscarry in the Numbers 5 passage, which is the biblical adultery test. So this is an intellectual issue, it's an emotional issue, it's a religious issue. It affects both secular and religious people. And most importantly, it affects individuals. Individuals who on one hand may be planning for a child but have missed timing, and others were not planning for a child and have missed timing. And we have to find ways to support life-affirming decisions that is, at the end of the day, what we on the spiritual path try to do, is to minister to life that is not just about suffering and pain. It can contain that, but we shouldn't rush headlong into it. We shouldn't create suffering in the name of the creator. Hmm. That's worth saying again, that it's your view that we should not create suffering in the name of the creator. Now that takes us to another question. Some states are even thinking about making abortion, making the woman guilty of murder if she has an abortion, that there would be, this would be seen as a criminal act, not only the outlawing of people performing abortions, but that the women would, act, women would actually be seen as a criminal. What's your response to that? I find this horrifying, and what I see is what I refer to as a word prison being constructed. Um, the funny thing is that you know, it's the mistaking, uh, you know, the difference between an adjective and a noun. At the moment of conception, you know, there is human DNA, but there is not a human. And if we declare that the definition of life is a cell, then the consequence of ending that life is murder. But there is nothing in science that says that is a being that we are terminating. And murder is a legal term. And this has been the challenge because there are definitions of law, definitions of religion, definitions of, in the secular world, and that argument about how we define the word is exactly the basis of the Roe ruling, you know, where they say that we need not resolve the difficult question of when life begins, when those trained in the respective disciplines of medicine, philosophy, and theology are unable to arrive at any consensus, the judiciary at this point in the development uh, of man's knowledge is not in a position to speculate as to the answer. Now, there going back on that, but no one can tell us when a being begins in that respect. We know that the process of life begins with fertilization, but I can say that the process of a photograph begins by exposing a negative to light. Sure, and then, you know, we forgot that we had that roll of film in the camera for the last two years and it's still been sitting there. It's the what you do to it afterwards. At the moment of conception, there is a, an instruction manual that is encoded into a single cell. It, it's living tissue, but it's not a life. 
So saying life begins at fertilization is an opinion that we're using the law to enforce. And it's not untrue, but the level at which it's true is orders of magnitude less important than the understanding of life as everything that happens from the moment of birth. Okay, well now there are some areas where people would take you on. They, there might be a bunch of people who would agree with you that up to six weeks, up to maybe eight weeks, you are in their, they're in your camp. But there are those who may agree that abortion is okay, but then when we get into more weeks, the, the last trimester, for example, they would say that now they can't possibly agree because in, especially with technology today, some fetuses can survive uh, that period. So um, I don't know if you've thought about that or if you have something to say about that period as it pertains to abortion. Oh, absolutely. And, and I invite that conversation. The challenge is that life is complicated and highly nuanced. And the abortion conversation now has become binary and without nuance. Mm. And if you say that the, the moment of fertilization, and when a woman doesn't know if she's pregnant, and when biology doesn't know if it will come to terms, that that is the moment that we have to defend, and we're not having that nuanced conversation. If we're saying that, well, six weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks, the last trimester, that we absolutely should be defending that developing life, that's a conversation worth having, absolutely. And it's the challenge is that the people who are against abortion fail to acknowledge that 90% of the time it's happening within the first trimester. It's often happening, you know, within the first eight weeks. And a lot of the times it's happening spontaneously through miscarriage. Mm. So if we want to figure out when absolutely we can't uh, end that development, that's a conversation that can be had. The challenge winds up being that when you see late term abortions, when you see that 10% that happens after the first trimester, it's usually because something horrible has presented itself. This is not women being frivolous or suddenly deciding, oh, I thought I wanted to have a baby, but you know what? Really, I want to go to Aruba. Uh, women are being treated as if they're frivolous in these decisions, and it's not. This is, this is the reason I wanted to do the interview, because you're right in what you say, that the conversation is not nuanced. And what's special about you is that you are open to examining the philosophical questions involved. You are willing to look at the possibilities. You're not saying that you're an absolutist. You're saying that we're not even having those conversations. Women are being demonized for no reason and there's a yes. great deal of suffering. That, that helps me understand a lot about why you wrote The Abortion yes. Dilemma. Now, were there any times that you got stuck in your pursuit of this information? Were there areas where Reverend Maul just, you know, hit a wall? Or maybe not? So, thank you. I, I, I like the question a lot. Um, <clears throat> I have no desire in the spiritual conversation to be right. I have a desire to serve the divine. Uh, dogma happens when you absolutely cannot be right. At the moment when you think you know better than anyone and never can be incorrect, then chances are you already have strayed from the path. Uh, it's an interesting conundrum. If the being that could create all of time and space and us and the universe can't figure out that there's going to be problems in communication, then there's something wrong. Why is it that even there's 4,200 different religions in the world and of the half of the population of the world who follow monotheism, there's three main divisions, right? There's Judaism, there's Christianity, and there's uh, Islam. So did God somehow make a mistake and couldn't get 
get the right message put across? Or is it that man has somehow lost the thread of what divine intent is? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I can't say that I am right. I can say that I am open to the truth. And one can seek the truth or one can seek to be right, but you can't seek both. Thank you, Jonathan D. Mall, the author of The Abortion Dilemma. Uh, I thank you for your time. I think we may have to have future discussions. Uh, I look forward to I it. Really, I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. You're very welcome.